Hey everyone, welcome to another Drift and Ruby interview. I'm David Kimura, and today I am interviewing Frank Rieta. Hey Dave. Hey everyone. So Frank, tell us a bit about yourself, why you're famous, and just some of the things that you and your business do. Sure, absolutely. So my name's Frank Rieta, and I have been part of the Ruby community since uh, 2011. Um, prior to that, I had, uh, like many other people, been uh, doing development um, in PHP, actually going back to the dot-com boom in the late 90s. Um, I started programming for the web and PHP 3 and MySQL 3 and all that stuff. Um, and I actually had a business at linowebhost.com um, that I started. And, uh, and um, that's where I got to really see how security can go badly. Um, anyway, my parents said, you have to go to college. So I did. I went to Georgia Tech, studied computer science and InfoSec, and then got really discouraged at coming out of the InfoSec program that everything seemed to be focused on like, go work for Microsoft, go work for the government, um, you know, network security, you know, this traditional approach to, to uh, information security was one of network security. And um, not a lot of people were applying it in the web space. So I ended up creating a business ultimately to make security part of web development. Um, and then turns out that ultimately landed me in Ruby uh, because Rails gives you so many tools. So when you're building something from scratch, the defaults are actually really good. Um, and then so that was a happy accident that now if someone is looking for Ruby on Rails and security, um, they're very likely to find me and my company. Um, so, but, oh, so the company part, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Rietta.com is, is the website. And what we're focused on is preventative web application security. The, the title I give to people is web application security architect. And, um, the idea is you cannot bolt security on at the end. You have to make it a holistic part of the development process. And so a lot of developers who are up and coming, they just want to create applications and they may not really have an understanding of what is security and what does it mean to have a secure web application. So can you talk to a uh, at a high level, a few different areas of where security is involved with the application development? And then also some other areas where web application security can come into play. Sure. Um, so there, you know, sometimes people say, but but I turn on SSL and that's all I need to do, right? I, I, I add Let's Encrypt. And, and that is not the case. Uh, transport security, um, you know, is just one tiny part of what it means to have a secure web application. The areas that you see a lot of mistakes happen, uh, there's a list called the OWASP Top 10. It's the Open Web Application Security Project, and they've been putting out a list uh, since about 2003. And um, that goes over a lot of the, the areas where people make the most mistakes. And so if I click on this here, you know, injection attack. So one of the top ones still is things like SQL injection. Someone's heard of it, but they're like, oh, I would never do that. But then I go review applications and they're taking a params hash and slamming it in an order clause to, to do a sort because they wanted to be dry and, and, and not repeat themselves with some sort of like if or case statement. Um, I'll see clever uses of constantize. Um, you know, again, they're trying to be dry. And so then they will end up, uh, effectively having constantines or eval in 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 their in their code base and that will allow a maliciously crafted input string to actually execute on the server um you know not locking the you know not being careful with their gems um and the update policies that you have supply chain attacks like um a couple of weeks ago uh the bootstrap sas gem actually was compromised, not not by the legitimate original authors, but someone said, ah, oh, this is a popular gem. And they gained access to 
uh, their Ruby gems credential and pushed up a malicious version that would actually execute, allow them to execute code on the server of any anybody who updated to that version just because they're like, oh, new version, bundle update. Um, so there's a lot. But what the, your normal developer, your average developer needs to know is that security has to be about defense in depth. And there are a number of, of, of avenues. You just don't add SSL. You have to make it part of your development. And you have to be aware of the major attacks, which is where the OWASP top 10 is an important tool. Okay, so that's at the application level. And so there's a lot of different tools at the application development level that we can do to assist or aid us in creating a secure web application. Can you talk to some of those tools and utilities? Oh, absolutely. So in the Ruby world, um, my two most famous uh, favorite uh, tools that, that I just use all the time and I recommend is Breakman. Um, and bundler audit. And so uh, they do two different tasks. So what Breakman does is it analyzes your your project source code. You literally run Breakman. Um, you can type, you can actually pipe it to an HTML file and it will generate a report of the co mis programming mistakes that commonly represent a security problem. So it's going to catch most of those unsafe SQL injections. It's going to catch when you um, have an unsafe.html safe and you're rendering user input in a view, um, which could lead to um, cross-site scripting. It's going to catch a lot of this. And it's not perfect. And sometimes it has false positives. But um, by and large, if, if, you, if you can't explain exactly why something it says is a false positive, then you should treat it as a failing test and actually fix it uh, right away. Um, the second tool I mentioned, Bundler Audit, what it does is it compares your your Ruby gems, um, your 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 gems and your gems dependencies uh, from your gem lock to uh, gems with known vulnerabilities, known CVEs, and it'll say, "Hey, this is out of date, and you need to update it." Um, and so those tool two tools really help up your game. Um, you know, it's kind of the table stakes of a web application security project um, in Ruby and Rails. Awesome. And so if we develop a secure web application, so there are no known non vulnerabilities within our code base, then we're good, right? We don't have to worry about anything else as long as it's served over SSL. Are we pretty much done with security or is there more to it? Now, um, one of the, the last items on the OWASP top 10 is about insufficient logging and monitoring. And uh, this is something I've seen in, in my work. Um, so imagine this, uh, you have a web app and it's attacked, but if you don't have good quality logs, you won't be able to investigate how it was attacked. Um, and it may be an extremely low volume attack. So, um, you know, sometimes we think about hackers as being the evil people over there. But if, you're, if your web application gets popular and big enough and you have an organization, then you end up with the insider threat. And so imagine for a moment you have uh, a, a web application that runs a business that has a lot of customers and you have customer service. So you have people who work on the inside. And so now you have a problem of what if a customer service agent goes rogue and you know starts acting inappropriately and accessing records they shouldn't. Uh, if you don't have good logs, you'll never catch that. And secondly, and, and more damaging, 63% of all data breaches are the result of lost or stolen credentials. So if all you have is, is your customer service agents logging in um, with a password, then someone who fishes that them or logs in as them could, could potentially breach your security, even if the application itself is perfect quote unquote so no it's it's just one part of a bigger defense in depth picture yeah and for the employee access there is something called a principle of least privilege and essentially what that allows or it states is that you shouldn't just give every user in your company full access to everything things should kind of be carp 
compartmentalized so that only people who need access to something has access to something. So if you have your web application code pretty much secure, you've taken into account that your employees only have access to the things that they need to have access to, every critical resource that they are accessing is using strong passwords along with something like a two-factor authentication, Google Auth, or something similar, are we pretty much good? Or is there anything else that they need to do to have a secure web application? Well, um, you know, that all sounds great until they find out that, and and maybe I'm following you differently. Um, so I, I am aware of, <laughs> I, I'm not sure um it's pub i can't say just someone familiar with the matter told me about um a situation where a uh that may make the news where a developer um somehow committed the source code that was meant to be completely closed uh to a public github repo and it included like production server secrets for an environment where um so so the sad answer is um there is no end to this rabbit hole. Um, you have to take a comprehensive approach. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like almost a case of the 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 attackers only have to be right once, and you, the defenders have to be right every single time. So mm -hmm. there's there's lots of ways to mess things up. Um, but if you have a comprehensive security program in place, if your application, um, you know, was developed using good good practices. You don't commit your secrets into the source code. You have proper segmentation of access. Um, I mean, there are always going to be people with extraordinary access, though. So, you know, for example, your system administrators, your developers, um, you know, they, they, they have server access. So in those cases, it becomes a lot about accountability. So um, that sometimes plays out in bigger organizations like you know, our AWS administrator uh, logs in at 3.30 in the morning. Um, was that because we had a support window or does he need to get a phone call, he or she, uh, to ask what what are you doing? You know, just a form of accountability, um, sometimes at those higher trust levels. Yeah, absolutely. And so in addition to all of that, I think that there's also a essential thing with convenience versus convenience within security. So I know that there was a company who thought it was convenient to have a always open VPN connection to their production environment. And essentially what that allowed was a malicious attack to attack their normal corporate network but because they had that VPN open, it tunneled into their production environment and started attacking all of those servers as well. So in addition to having all of these great securities, you also have to make sure that you're not giving too much convenience to them because then you open up that kind of situation where you're creating a tunnel that you have always open and then you're leaving your production environment vulnerable, or you're just opening up another window of attack there. So in addition to all of this that we've talked about so far, is there anything else that we need to know about security? So if our application code secure, we have our employee base secure, is our production servers basically going to be secure as well? Or is there things that we can do to harden the security of our production environment? So there's two aspects to this. Um, before we go into hardening, I want to I want to talk about a crisis that we have at the enterprise level. Um, and now many people listening here, you know, you're maybe working in a startup, you're working on a fun app, um, but imagine that it becomes wildly successful and becomes part of a big grown up corporation someday. Uh, one of the big crises is it takes way too long to patch. Um, I don't have the stat in front of me, but the average time to patch a security vulnerability of any consequence was over 30 days. I can't remember if it is a long time. Um, and th the pr 
problem with that is that when you have a major vulnerability, uh, you're in a race against time. And so you have to be able to patch much, 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 much faster um, than than has previously been done. And if you think that this isn't, you know, applicable, you got to remember effectively Equifax was breached and 163 million Americans private financial data was stolen because they did not patch their Apache struts open source uh, framework uh, to get the latest security updates. And that patch had been available for months, um, but they did not apply it because their processes to test and build and do that just weren't there. Um, so uh, CICD goes a long way and practicing test-driven development because one of the biggest reasons that companies are slow to patch is that they're they're afraid that will break something and then that they will it will stop working and so for that reason they don't patch um so you know think about it just recently um our our good friend uh and uh and uh core rails core team member aaron patterson you know pushed up a bunch of security updates for rails you know how many how many of your apps have been updated already and uh if you know we're working on it it's one thing but if it's in in production use I've seen tons of grossly out of date Ruby installations where the Rails version is way out of support and no one's updating it at all. And so make it easy to patch and make it often the patches, number one. Um, since you may have had a different question, Dave, um, do we, uh, did you want to redirect that? But that was what came to mind first. Yeah. So with the, actual servers that we're spinning up, whether it is virtual machines, bare metal, physical servers, is there anything that we can do to harden those to oh, reduce yeah, sure. the service level attacks? Oh, absolutely. So, so okay. So uh, if you are installing virtual machines, you're, you're effectively just putting a computer on, on the internet. Um, and sometimes when you're using cloud services, so, um, Let's take your S3 buckets or, or whatever. If you do that, the biggest ones to make sure they're locked down. Um, you know, a lot of data gets leaked because buckets are left public on the web. So don't do that. Um, the on the on the Linux server side. So uh, generally, uh, it depends on your version. But if you search, let's say you're going to do Ubuntu 18.04, which is the latest LTS, and you're going to put it on a virtual machine on DigitalOcean, um, search for Ubuntu 18.04 hardening guide. Um, if you're doing FreeBSD, FreeBSD hardening guide. Um, and what those th are going to walk you through is, is take the base installation and tweak the configs a little bit to make it a bit more secure. What, what I've usually done, and it's, the defaults are a lot better than they were when I got started. <laughs> it used to be you, you installed mm -hmm. Linux and then you'd be hacked in like five minutes if you put it out of the web. Uh, that doesn't seem to so much be the case. But um, the areas that you're... Uh, you want to get done right away is when when I when I install a Linux server, um, my first step will be to uh, enable the UFW firewall. Um, UFW controls IP tables, but it's kind of nice. You the commands are a little simpler, um, so there's lots of instructions. I will uh, allow uh, on my SSH port. I will either block it or sometimes I put in another port, but but I will turn on rate limiting at the firewall level. So if, if something is hitting it too fast, um, it will slow it down. Um, it'll, it'll block the IP. Um, I'll usually install fail to ban. Uh, fail to ban is a useful tool. Um, it's been around for a long time. There are limitations, but it basically looks for, say, authentication error logs, and then will block the IP for a period of time. But um, on SSH, the biggest one is I edit the slash etc slash sshd SSH underscore anyway the server config and I turn off password authentication I add my SSH public key and I do key only authentication to all my servers because that's like a big way um, you know if, if, if your password is crackable and you have SSH on open to the public you're going to get pwned like there's SSH is being hammered all the time uh, so that's the locking that down is is goal number one. Like, actually, that's probably the biggest rule. If you put a Linux box with SSH on the web and your password is not really freaking secure, you will get hit. 
Um, I mean, if you look at the log files, I mean, SSH worms have been going on for decades. Uh, so that's oh, yeah. that's rule number one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And is there anything else at the application or at the server level? So you you said firewalls having the only the appropriate ports open up and then hardening your SSH config. Is that really all there is to the server level security now, or is there a lot more to it? I mean, in broad strokes, yes, in a way that is. Um, when you start installing um, your services, uh, there, the principle of least privilege comes back. Um, you know, So for example, you don't want your web server running as root because uh, then your application, um, you know, when there is a problem and there's what's called a remote code execution, that means someone could um, expand out access. Um, another common mistake um, is to be too permissive in your, your file system permissions. Uh, so, for example, I've seen an attack where, and I know this is drifting Ruby, not drifting Py uh, PHP, but you know, I saw it in a PHP world and it could happen in Ruby too, where uh, the web application allowed a file name to be specified as an upload. And the mm -hmm. attack was to use that to write the crontab file for the user. And then when crontab ran again, it executed the code that the, uh, that the uh, attacker wanted to upload and execute on the web server. So you, you want to run everything in the least privilege possible, and you want to make sure that your, your web stuff doesn't have access um, to system resources. Um, otherwise, you can get popped. Oh, absolutely. So, and, 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 oh, and let me add, add to that. If you're like, oh, well, you know, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Well, a lot of times we're, we're pushing our server secrets um, in environment variables now. And so if you're able to execute arbitrary code as the deploy user, you can get the environment variable content, which then means you have date potentially have database access, which means I can uh, exfiltrate your entire database and, and just, you know, full full take. So, yeah, no, there's a lot you have to do. Yeah, and a couple of other notes around security and when we talk about security, I think it's important to not just think about our application being secure, but then we're also talking about securing our clients' data to making sure that we're not leaking information. And one thing that I often see, and Rails does a good job by default, but it only has a certain level of visibility into our application to understand what is sensitive data. So it knows by default that your passwords are sensitive that your passwords are sensitive, that the password confirmation is censored, <clears throat> sensitive. But it doesn't know things like a social security number or something like that. So by default, it's going to allow that to be logged into your database logs. If you are doing log shipping up to something like Sumo Logic or somewhere else, then you're basically sending all that plain text data up to a third party and that could open up your service level attack so make sure that you are going into your rails configuration and adding in the parameters or the attributes that you want to be scrubbed from your logs so that's another important part of your application security in my opinion I agree. And I was just pulling up a project that were, had to be GDPR compliant. And when you were, as you're talking and yeah, we had to add to the uh, rails application, rails.application.config.filter parameters. I can't remember is filter parameter logging .rb initializer. Is that standard in rails or is this something I added? I don't remember, but uh, by default, it's just a password hash to your point, right? But you can add additional parameters, and now Rails will filter that out of log. So what we did was the password, the access token, the email, because in GDPR mm -hmm. land, email is really freaking protected. Um, uh, so basically, first name, last name, so IP address. So the idea was filter these out of the logs so that... Um, 
you know, they're not there in the first place. And uh, I go a step further, actually, Dave, um, in the uh, in this case, I we used Rollbar to gather our exception data. And I made sure that Rollbar was filtering out the same parameters because I've seen it tons of times when you're accessing Rollbar and it has like session cookies. Like you're creating a database that would allow if anyone with access to your roll bar to do really terrible things to your application. Um, oh, yeah. And it's a major could be a major problem. So, yeah, definitely want to filter out session cookies if if, <laughs> if you didn't pick up what I was saying to everyone. <laughs> yeah. And so there are some companies out there that their main focus is to do static code analysis and browser level attacks. Is there any value in those companies if you believe that you've hardened your application code and you've done your unit test, you think that you have a pretty good set of feature tests and stuff like that? Or do those companies still provide value in reporting in your vulnerabilities or are you pretty much good if you just use Breakman and Bundler Audit? Use Breakman and Bundler Audit, and they report nothing, and you have done all this, then you are way ahead of the game. However, you may have missed stuff. And um, in business case environments, um, often you do need that third party validation so you know it, it's it's almost like getting your taxes audited um well maybe that's a bad analogy anyway generally in in a case where you have an auditor the auditor is not supposed to be the same person that did it mm -hmm. <laughs> like that looks bad so so often for business purposes there is value in a third party review um you know to say hey look we 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 did all the security stuff We've been audited by a third party, so of course you can trust our our e patient information system, you know, for your for your medical practice, you know. So if, if that's the direction, then there's definite value. Um, so that's kind of a business case, but you know, uh, man, I would love it to find that I audit an app where I find nothing wrong. Uh, that has yet to happen, um, but. Sometimes I go in and someone did take care of the basics. And, and honestly, I smile because, you know, as a code reviewer, if I can, um, you know, write an, an email to the boss and, and, and say that, you know, I've been reviewing this thing for hours and like I it's actually pretty good. Like I'm finding a couple of things around the edges, but your team has been like rock solid. Like that's kind of like the funnest thing to be able to say. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, versus like, OK. Here's all the red. So, yeah. And so, in addition to the tools that we've mentioned, I want to mention a couple others. One is actually created by Ruby and it's called Metasploit. And it can give you some good insights into uh, possible attack services to your application. It can go through and do some pretty nifty things. So, have you used that tool very much or are you familiar with it? I am familiar with Metasploit. It's a pen testing platform. Um, as a Ruby developer, I have not used it very often. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 the Mac Daddy. It's it's used by both good guys and bad guys alike. Um, so it's worth knowing about. Yeah. And another one that I have used and that I really like if I am preparing my application for a third party review is a wasp zap. And it's basically an attack proxy, which you can have your web application up and running on your local development machine, run through a proxy and then access your application. And because it's going through a proxy, even if you have a SSL certificate, it's kind of a man in the middle attack that you are allowing because it's going to look at all of that traffic and then basically identify any vulnerabilities within your code and it's able to do that because it's looking at the javascript that's running it's looking at all of the 
responses and stuff. So not at the code level, but more at a higher level, it's going to be able to easily detect stuff like uh, cross-site scripting and stuff like that. Yeah, and cross-site scripting is actually an interesting one because uh, Ruby and Rails by default pretty much protects you from it. So in order to have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you have to take actions such as using .html safe uh, instead of sanitize. Uh, so that is also something that Breakman's going to have flagged you on earlier. So by the time you're running this, hopefully it won't find that problem because you'll have done all the right things before. Um, that proxy approach is is pretty much how you do penetration testing, um, you know, outside in testing without looking at the source code. And uh, another tool that's very similar that is used a lot is called Burp Suite. There's a community free edition, but if you just need like a cheap external pen test because for business reasons, you can buy the pro version for a year for like 349 bucks. And it has an automated scanner that will scan for a lot of things that, that aren't the community edition. You would have to have a lot of knowledge to pull off yourself. So if you just need a quick and dirty, we ran an external tool. That's a very affordable way to, 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 to show, Hey, look, we ran Burt Fleet pro and it didn't find anything. Um, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. And I think also, and this is my opinion that, the closer that you stick to the Rails core way of doing things, the less likely you're going to introduce unknown vulnerabilities. So when you start adding in stuff like a standalone JavaScript framework that's talking to a Rails API, you're going to be able to harden the Rails API pretty easily because for the most part, that is going to stick to the Rails core since Rails 5 introduced the API only. However, now with this API front end, that you know whether it is react or something else you're i believe that you're going to have a lot harder time securing that down in addition to your rails api then you also have to worry about your hosting you're just opening up more surfaces for attack yeah i mean the, every if you want to have a secure system you have to keep it super simple i mean yeah, that that Absolutely. applies to a lot of things in life but um, especially security. And even choices that are made within the Rails application, if you sit closer to the Rails core way of doing things, so you don't go off and add in hundreds of different gems, because not only is that going to make updating your Rails version to a newer version to address a CVE more difficult, but then you're also introducing many other vulnerabilities that could be potentially within other gems, like you said, with the Bootstrap SaaS gem and stuff like that. And to be fair, Bootstrap SaaS itself is legitimate, but but what happened with the supply chain attack was that you know some nefarious people used its popularity to to add a vulnerability that wasn't there before, and that not even just a vulnerability, but a backdoor, like an intentional backdoor, and uh, and that just shows that every time you use third party code, you're trusting strangers to do the right thing and to have wonderful OPSEC. And, um, you know, maybe on Rails core, you know, we want to trust Rails core because well, we have no choice. It's huge and prov provides crazy functionality. But, you know, sometimes there's really tiny gems that do barely, you know, just some tiny small thing. And, you know, you would be better off just writing code in your own application to do that thing so that you didn't have this third party entanglement um, because you know again you know let's say you know our friend bob makes a gem because he you know he has he's passionate about it well is bob going to still be updating and maintaining in 2023 i mean software mm -hmm. we right now could run for a decade or more and uh and has to be maintained so yeah, and that reminds me of another vulnerability that you might have is using third-party services. So I remember GitHub, uh, this is probably many years back now, they had a massive security vulnerability where they had basically all their attributes whitelisted. They didn't actively blacklist one. So someone changed the user admin 
a variable or in a form, they just overwrote like their name to admin. And then that allowed it to get posted to the admin attribute. And they basically gave themselves system level access to GitHub, which in, then in turn, they could uh, get access to your source code, which in turn, they could search your source code for vulnerabilities or any keys committed and stuff like that. Yeah, stuff happens. Um, we've been talking about scanning. I've noticed that GitHub has really started to up their game about warning you about some certain classes of security issues with your code base automatically, which is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, uh, yeah, no, anytime you th trust a third party service, um, they gain access. And, you know, so if you're doing security properly, um, it's like cryptography and open source. Uh, the, the secrecy of your code base should not be the basis for your security. If it is, then you're doing it wrong. Uh, however, if you think, ah, oh, you know, this is a private repo, it's okay to put our server secrets that, you know, are used to encrypt our client data and that's in your source code, then, then that is a massive, massive vulnerability um, given that, you know, GitHub could be hacked or more likely one of your developers pushes a cloned copy to another GitHub or Git repository that you didn't create, not knowing the repercussions. So there's lots oh. of ways for your code and the secrets in there to leak that have nothing to do with GitHub security. GitHub's as an organization does a pretty good job overall. Um, so yeah. I just want to broaden that so that this isn't just a picking on our cloud service provider <laughs> <laughs> tweak. So if you have secrets in your code, they can leak. And so your security of your production environment should not depend about keeping that from leaking. Yeah. Well, is there anything else sh that we should cover? I mean, it's a mile wide and an inch, an inch deep. That's always the challenge here. Yeah. Um, I would say that, you know, my takeaways for anyone listening is um, as a developer, uh, security is a matter of professional ethics. Sometimes uh, we're asked as developers to build something and you sit there and you cringe a little bit and you're like, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, it's a good thing to push back. Um, um, you know, try to get the security considerations worked into the requirements, into the, the user stories. Uh, there's a tool. Uh, we didn't talk about this earlier. It's called abuser story. So when you write a a user story from the point of view of, uh, you know, as a user, I want to log in and do this fun thing. You can add abuser stories like, you know, as a malicious person, um, I see that what looks like uh, an account ID in the URL because it's arrest, right? And so I change it to something else to see what will happen. And this helps answer that question, but why would anyone ever do this? And it, um, makes it part of the requirements, um, which helps you move security forward. Uh, secondly, if you ever do something that you just know you should do, like um, we talked about HTML safe and sanitize. So suppose that Susan is working on a project and, and she's asked to uh, make this, this field uh, support HTML and she just knows that she should use sanitize. Like it's just the right way to do that. <laughs> But she doesn't write a test for it. So she only writes a test for the feature that the customer specified. What then happens is, let's say Bob comes around and he's tasked with adding support for, say, HTML tables. Um, he doesn't know that Susan did sanitize to prevent cross-site scripting. And so he writes a test for to show that the tables works and he changes sanitize to .html safe. Now the application has become vulnerable despite the fact that Susan knew that using that would make it a, a security problem. Now, hopefully Brakeman will catch it, but there could be situations that Brakeman wouldn't catch. So if you're doing something that you know is for security, write a test that will fail if someone disables that security um, feature in the future. Yeah, it's great advice. Well, Frank, if people want to find you online, where should they go? Uh, R I E T T A dot com, Rietta dot com. Um, I also am on Twitter, Frank Rietta, 
and I can be emailed at frank at rieta.com. So um, all sorts of ways to reach out. And I'm always happy to try to point people in the right direction, even, even if it's just asking for some advice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to talk with me today on rail security and our server security stuff. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed this. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.